Welcome to another episode of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast. I'm your brother, Ogar, from Hip Hop News Uncensored, and sitting across from me is my co-host. What up, what up, y'all? It's your man, Sam, and CEO of Vile Hip Hop News. You're in the building for a very special edition of the Hip Hop Uncensored Podcast, and what better guest to have today yeah. than Hip Hop OG, Hip Hop Legend Cormega on the podcast. How you feeling today, family? It's all great, man. Thanks for having me. Nah, pressure's all ours. Like I was telling my cuz before we got on here, it's kind of crazy how everything comes full circle because this is actually our last time in this building as we're about to move on to a bigger and better building. Very excited about that. But some of my early times in this building, I spent in that office right behind me looking at this album, the true meaning behind me, talking to a brother by the name of DR, period, because I was signed oh, okay. label at the time. So I'm staring at this album. And I was like, damn, I would love to do a record with Cormega. And here we are the last day in this building. And me and my cousin interviewing, man. So what a pleasure, brother. It's truly an honor, man. And we appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you guys as well. No yes, doubt. sir. So, man, how you doing? And first, I want to ask you, man, um, the other day, Coolio, you know, he passed away. Now, we don't know how he passed away, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew him or not. But um, if you did, let us know. But if not, how do you feel about, you know, the tragic passing of Coolio? Um, I never met Coolio. I didn't know him. Okay. But, um... The thing, when I seen that, I was like, wow. And I looked at it from a different perspective of just a rapper dying. I looked at the culture, the genre as a whole. And I said to myself, wow, um, we getting to that point. Like now we're starting to grow older with the culture. Cause you remember when rap first came out, Rap is, on, rap is only about to turn 50 years old. Right. So you think about some of the key players in it, some of the key right. contributors, whether it was the pioneers or people that came out in the 90s, you know what I'm saying, like Julio. I don't know if he originated in the 80s, but his prime was in, his in the 90s. Right. You know, a lot of guys are starting to get older. And, you know, it happens in every genre. It happens in every walk of life. As we get older, some of us die. It's, it's our health sometimes, sometimes it's the way we, you know, the conditions that we lived in. So we're at that stage where we're, we're about to, we're going to lose brothers consistently. And it made me think, wow, I seen him, he was almost 60 years old. Right. And I'm like, you know, looking at life, like rap as a, as, as a whole, at a certain point, we lived real hard. Just like certain rockers, a lot of rockers didn't make it. They died mm -hmm. young. Right. You know, I was talking to a friend recently and it was like I was talking about like how somebody I know uh drinks Hennessy every day. And uh and they was like, What? Like, you know what I'm saying? I know but that's just a regular person. Now we talk about rap. We probably all know rappers that drink and smoke every day. Mm -hmm. So you you drink and you smoke every day, right? Um one another thing that we take for granted. Sleep. We have this mentality. We don't sleep. We hustle or stay. Up. Sleep is one of the most important things that you need. You got to recharge your body. So it's like the way that a lot of rappers live. They drink every day. They smoke every day. Outside a lot. Lack of sleep. We don't eat the right food. I'm saying we just so I'm not pointing fingers at people. Right. A lot of times we don't eat to eat correctly either. We might eat fast food every day. So it's like those lifestyles are starting to catch up to some of us. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we see some of our pioneers and they look crazy to us, like uh, their health. It's like, wow, it was sad. And it's like the way that we take care of ourselves is inevitably starting to catch up to us as we start to get older. Now, you know, that's Coolio. What about the people that are older than him? And what about the people that first came into hip hop? Some of those guys are in their 60s now. You know what I'm saying? None, nobody in hip hop is 70 years old. So you got guys in their 60s. Mm -hmm. So that means in the next 10, next 20 years, we're going to see a lot of decline. I mean, we're going to see a lot of unfortunate passing away because we're getting older. The, the genre is getting older. So a lot of the key figures that was in the game are reaching those, those ages where, you know, life expectancy at one point was 65 years old. You know what I'm saying? For certain people that live a certain lifestyle. And when you live a better lifestyle, it, it improves. So a lot of there's there's a lot of brothers that just don't take care of themselves. And there's a lot of brothers that have um underlying health issues. Yes. And it catches up with us. So 
Now we see it happen to a brother like Julio, and we're shocked and uh, we're sad because he's because he's a known name. But this this happens with all of us, with with, with society as a whole. My man Black Rob, I did, I did not want to see him pass away like that. You know that mm-hmm. that that I knew Black Rob. You know what I'm saying? So it was like we have to look at each other, and we have to try to push ourselves collectively to take care of each other. Like we want to. We love each other. We want to take the same way you can put your man onto a new drink, put him on a new diet. Same way you can put your man onto some new weed, put him onto some new um, herbal supplements. You know what I'm saying? Same way you say chase the bag. You want to chase something? Chase, run, go jog. Let's go for a walk. Right. Let's walk. We got to push ourselves to do better because this unfortunate thing with Coolio and with other brothers is it's, it's what's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? You know, that's deep because when you look at just the kind of the overall spectrum of hip hop right now, there's a lot to talk about within hip hop. But as we start seeing some of the older legendary pioneers of hip hop begin to kind of, I don't want to say fade out, begin to eventually move out of the out of the limelight. And we see the new age of hip hop usher in, we see the gap in the distance between it. We seen a, a very famous media personality, somebody very connected to hip hop today, say that some of the older genre is dusty and some of the older genre is old. And then we see the violence in hip hop. We got the health and what put our elders and we got the violence with our youth. So as a whole, when you see what the industry is portraying and what the industry is promoting, how do you feel about hip hop from that perspective? Uh, when I see that, I know that's not hip hop at all. I think some of that stuff is, uh, I think some of it is ignorance. Mm-hmm. And when I mean ignorance, I mean, from lack of knowing or for having lack of understanding. I think if the brother who said, I think the brother who said the, the thing about the dusty uh, pioneers and stuff, I know who he is, I, we all know who he is. Um, I really think he should exercise knowing, knowing the full meaning of the word empathy empathy putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and i think he should fully exercise the word appreciation Mm -hmm. so as one of the elders said if it wasn't for them he wouldn't have a platform uh he didn't create this platform he benefited from the prosperity of this platform that was created by those people that paved the way. Some of those people, innovators are off, often met with resistance. Some of the people that paved the way will never get what the later generations get. I mean, there's baseball players that are garbage that make more than Jackie Robinson ever made in his whole career. Mm-hmm. There's basketball players that sit on the bench that are terrible, that made more in one season than Bill Russell made in his entire career. So. Right now, you are basking in the flavorful juice that came from the fruit of others' labor. So the, the most you could do is have some fucking respect. So when when hip hop first came out, you got to understand it wasn't a lucrative dynamic. It was an escape from something. It's like mm-hmm. sometimes some people are stressed out, they'll go smoke or they'll go have a drink or they'll go for a walk. Hip hop was... Hip hop was keeping people out of the street. You know, when they first made it, one of the most popular slangs in hip hop was one of the most popular phrases was peace, unity, love, and having fun. That was that's the first four key words that they were saying: peace, unity, love, and having fun. It was trying to keep people out of gangs. It was trying to keep people out of the street. It wasn't monetized. Mm-hmm. Um, so when the money started coming, a lot of the people that 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 created the lanes, they didn't they didn't get to reap the benefits of it because time had went on. But they laid the track. They laid the track down. They laid the track work down for us. So I don't think none of us is ever in a position to just those that came before us that did something for us. It's kind of like being an ungrateful child to your parents that did everything for you or people in your family did everything for you and you don't acknowledge them. So I think that brother needs to to do some self-reflecting and and understand the difference between an OG 
like them and him is they made it there. Like you'll be blessed to make it to the age. And when you make it to the age, will your contribution be so strong that people remember who you are or will you be a dusty old person? Powerful, powerful. Let's talk about the music, man. Let's talk about, you know, your new project coming out, The Realness too. Um, I know the one was classic, obviously. Um, I think you said you supposed to release it in 2020, but you pushed it back a little bit. So talk about, you know, the mindset behind, you know, um, putting The Realness 2 out and really trying to make it, you know, a, just as great as number one. Um. Making it just as good as number one was ultimately the goal. Uh, number the first runs was so difficult to top because it was so well received. Mm -hmm. um, so when I made the realness two, I initially did it because of the fans. I, I never wanted to make a sequel, but the fans kind of put the battery in my back. And then, um, you know, as as uh, as the album started forming. I knew I needed one song that's going to set the tone for the whole album. That's the intro. Once you got the intro, then you could build around that. So once I had the intro, Domingo did the intro. He's another legendary producer. Once he did the intro, I knew the direction that I wanted to go in. And um, as the album started progressing, more blessings started happening from me having patience. One of the best things that ever happened with me in my life, my greatest acquisition in recent years was patience because mm. um it took patience to make this album you got to understand i have like 11 producers on this album and each one of them is is kind of kind of a somebody the only guy that is new is big ty and um the young guy um came on the track but the guy there's a guy named pops his, his name might not be that known to some of us but you look at his at his resume he's worked with drake and this one and that one, you know, Domingo's worked with Big Pun and this one and that one. Then I had Law Professor, you got Havoc, I got Harry Freud, I got Shaw Money XL. You know, there's some street runners. Street runners probably top five hottest producers in the game right now, but you wouldn't know it if you knew him because he's so humble. And then when you look at God did, see, Street Runner is 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 a perfect example. You take an album like God did, Khaled is one of the most flashy outgoing people in the world so you'll know Khaled did good with his album or you'll know his album's out god did you know how he is he's very vocal right well i say that to say this on that album god did that he promoted the hell out of street runner did eight songs on that album <laughs> him and his partner Tariq Asim, eight eight songs on that album were produced by street runner he's produced a song with Nas and jay-z that came out a few years ago he just does with little wayne he, he, he he's a big deal but he doesn't act like it so it took patience. It took patience and it took understanding. It was patience for me saying, if Street Runner take along with a beat, I'm gonna fall back and I'm gonna play my position because he's working with superstars. And the fact that he's even working with me is something that I don't take for granted. I appreciate that because a lot of people when they get on messing with those type of level artists, then they don't wanna mess with people like me or like underground artists or like, you know what I'm saying? They overlook us they, for bigger things. Mm -hmm. So. You got Street Run on the album. Like that, it took patience. I'm work. It's like eleven producers on this album, and then I got three features on this album. And then we had a pandemic that slowed down things. I didn't even want to record for a while. I didn't want to be around people. So all that, all that time and patience and creativity culminated into this album. And the best thing that happened with this album from patience is um, I got the Nas verse. I got Harry Freud on the album, another dope producer. And I got my man, one of my icons that I look up to, to narrate on my album. Um, Russell Simmons is, is on the album. He talked on one of the songs, Man vs. Myth. So this album is, like you said, it's a full circle moment for me too, because the first record deal that I ever had was when I signed the Violator slash Def Jam. And then who built Def Jam? Russell Simmons. So the fact that he's talking on my album and the fact that uh Nas is on this album it's just and it's the first time me and Nas have done a song with just me and Nas and that's something that the fans have been wanting so I think this album matches up very well against the realness oh, oh. that's interesting because when you look at the realness and when you drop that and you had five for 40 fallen soldiers dramatic interest Thunder Kiko mm -hmm. classic Jones but yeah. definitely in a different mind space at that time mm -hmm. 
So talk about how those songs kind of evolved with you throughout time and how they compare to the realest one. Well, when I made Five for 40, that was like me just talking to the block. Um, yeah. I was talking about my life, my that perspective of me at that moment. On this album, I made a, a song called Age of Age of Wisdom. That's like the predecessor to Five for 40. Mm. So it starts off the same too. Instead of saying, I said I was a young nigga hustling, me serving the D was unheard of unless the D served me. That was on Five for 40. Mm-hmm. Now, I said I was a young dealer hustling. Um, the streets of, you know, I forgot how, how I go totally, but I started off, I was a young dealer hustling. Mm. Instead of using the word nigga, I try to not use the word nigga anymore. So mm. That's another change in me. But uh, so there's this there's ev- there's evolution. I'm evolving in uh in that dynamic of talking street, but not glorifying it and from a mature perspective. Because it comes to a certain point when I don't want to hear certain age, certain certain age <laughs> demographic of rapper, I don't want to hear you talking about you busting your gun. I don't want to hear about you in the whole in the hallway, yeah, I'm in the hotel lobby, da da da. I don't want to hear you certain things I don't want to hear from mature rappers. You know, I'm right. I'm getting money in the in the I'm doing this or I'm doing that. I don't want to hear certain things from a certain um demographic. I think we gotta show maturity and still we can still do what we do, but we gotta do it in a mature way without looking goofy or without looking like we're trying to compete with younger people. Because you'll never there's no cool way to compete with a younger person if you're if you're older. You just look crazy. You know what I'm saying? So just be, just be you. Um, be like Uncle Charlie. Uncle Charlie just doing him. Mm-hmm. That's right. right. Now I don't know if you're one of the first artists to go independent, but um, you know, clear it up if you are. And how has things changed since you know then? Because I think I don't know for this project, I think you got a, a partnership deal. So talk about being independent and then you know the ups and downs of that, and you know now getting into a partnership deal. Well. I was not the first person to go independent. I did not invent the wheel. Okay. Um, on the East Coast, I always give credit where it's due. The first person I knew that went independent from New York was Freddie Fox. Oh, okay. He had an album called, um, I think it was Industry Shakedown or something like that. He came out independently before me. Um, that's the first person I know of to go to come out indie. The one the thing that I did do first before everybody was doing it, was doing mixtapes as albums. I was doing mixtapes. Nobody did mixtape before me. So that, I could say I created that with, but I won't take credit for uh, for the independent thing. Um, Freddie Fox did that. Um, I learned I learned to take independent game series from, from my brothers in California, in the Bay. People in the Bay are notorious good hustlers. And when I seen uh, people like Marl Fakers, Jacka, and the uh, was making a comfortable living off of rap, and they wasn't even known about nowhere else. Just from being local, they were able to, you know, afford a good life. You know, I stayed in their house before. They had a dope house and everything. So I was like, wow. So they opened my eyes up to being independent. And um, DJ J Love, because at one point when I didn't even want to rap no more, he was always on me about, yo, make the album, make an album, just make just make this one album, and then you can just do what you want to do. So when I went independent, I think I brought a lot of light to it. I didn't create it, but I brought a lot of glory to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I made it cool. Because at one point they were saying independent is not cool or it's like for people that labels don't want to deal with or stuff like that. And and it was frowned upon. It was like nobody took it serious. And even if they went indie, some people would say, oh, I'm going to go independent on this album and then I'm going to get a deal. And that's like saying, I'm going to be on this plan. <laughs> Yo, man, I'm free out here. You know what I'm saying? But it's hard. So I'm about to go back to that plantation that was nice. I'm about to go to the nice, you know, the, the nice master. Uh-huh. That's pretty much what you're saying, because I can sell 10,000 records and make $100,000. You can't do that on a major. You can't even sell platinum and make $100,000 at a major. The way that their deals were structured, you know what I'm saying? Like, how much money do you get? How much money do you get off of each record sale? I said on the album, in, on the album Mega Philosophy, a song called Industry. I said a rap, a, a label makes ten million when you see these platinum. It's ten million when you go platinum. That's ten million dollars made. How many rappers do you know that have ten million dollars? 
you know, even now we, we have us having this billionaires and you know there's a lot of prosperity going on but that, that's from having multiple ventures mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so when a rapper sells a, mi a million copies platinum 10 million dollars is generated that means if you went uh triple platinum 30 million dollars is generated so you have you have a scratch your head as, as to why you see so many horror stories in the music industry. TLC should have never had an issue financially. Tony Braxton should have never had financial issues. There's so many artists that we all see that went through stuff that never should have financial uh, issues because they sold so many records, but it's the labels that benefit. So being independent taught me, wow, you really get you really get the, the most for your buck when you're independent. You might not have the notoriety, you might not be as famous, but you're going to get your money's worth and you're going to have to work harder. Like this week alone, look, I was supposed to do the interview with y'all. I forgot what day it was, but I was burnt out. I was like, Tuesday, Tuesday, I'm in Long Island, far part of Long, Long Island. Then that same night, I had to drive all the way to a far part of Pennsylvania. By Wednesday morning, I'm filming a video in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? By, by uh, Wednesday night, I'm back in Pennsylvania doing something else. By Thursday morning, I'm at Sirius Satellite doing three interviews. And wow. then after that, I had to go straight to IMI Studios for my listening session. So, yeah. so it's like, it's a lot of grinding. Yeah. So independent ain't for people that just want the end result. You gotta wanna put in that work. Like you don't wanna, you wanna be the champion until you see the champion running and hitting the bag, sparring and putting in a sweat equity. You got to work hard. If you work hard independently, you're going to win if you have the talent. And if you treat your fan base with respect, look, yo, look, at look, y'all interviewing me now, 21 years after my debut album came out. <laughs> you know how many, you know how many rappers from that, from my genre, from my era, y'all probably don't even want to interview. You know, many, you know how many rappers from my, from my era that can't even get an independent deal, can't even get an indie deal. They can't even get shows overseas. So I'm blessed. And I and I owe that all to the fans. You know what I'm saying? Hard work and fans. You treat your fans like they're your boss because they really are. Right. So independence is, is you guys know what it is. Independence is a beautiful, lucrative thing. Yeah. You put in the work. Absolutely. And work 100%. You got to put in the work. You got you to work 10 times harder than somebody, you know in my opinion. But you went independent when it wasn't popular to do. Exactly. Right? And then you did that out of coming out of a label and i've been in those type of situations on a very low level and it made me fall out of love of the music you know what i mean i love the music that's why i got into it the business side of the industry really made me fall out of love at it so I, right. I would love to know your mindset as you're dealing with the industry you're dealing with your label deal you find it upon yourself or take it upon yourself to go independent something that wasn't popular back then what was your mindset like transitioning from the label dealing with whatever you dealt with the label and then transitioning into that. How, how was you thinking back then? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to keep it real with you. Since I'm since we keeping it real, I'm going to keep it real with you. When I first made an independent album, I still, I was one foot in the street and one foot in the studio. My mentality was, you know, moving keys out of state. That was my mentality. Like, yo, I want to do, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know what I want. That was my mentality. Like, I was, like you said, it's sad how the business part can kill your love for the music. Mm -hmm. And it should never be like that. Right. It happened to me before. I was so frustrated with the industry. I didn't want nothing to do with it. So I started going back to the street. And one of my best friends, his name was Blue. I mentioned him on Fallen Soldiers on the first film, right? He was getting money, very popular in his town. And um, one day I was in New York and I was doing a video, right? And um, I was with Nas and a bunch of Queen Bridge guys. It was during um, Queen Bridge Finest, right? I believe it was a Sunday we was, we was filming. On Monday morning, I got the call. It's like, yo, Mega Man, I think your man Blue got killed. Damn. So I'm like, what? So I called down south, and it's like, yo, Blue got killed. And my man Blue got killed. And, uh, if you listen to the album True Meaning, I think it was Verbal Graffiti. I said, I said something about Blue getting killed. I said the deep shit, three bricks. I said the deep shit, three bricks remain uncovered. That um, 
the industry didn't want me and they tried to condemn me. Springwell of Rap, they even tried to suspend me. Around, around that area where I said, the deep shit is three bitches. We may not uncover it. I was talking to Blue and I was talking about Blue. Mm -hmm. So basically, when my man, I don't know what happened because I wasn't there. I was in New York. Something, something transpired and he got killed and the work got missing. So his voice haunted me because he was like, one day we was talking, like how me and you guys were talking. And he was like, yo, Mega Man, don't forget you're a rapper. Because my mom was like, yo, I'm going to flip this. I'm going to get this car. We're going to do this. We're going to go ahead. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And he was like, don't forget you're a rapper. Uh -huh. He's like, I was a fan of you also. Like, don't forget you're a rapper. Right. So he basically told me so many ways. Don't get consumed with this. And when he died, I just heard, don't forget you're a rapper. It haunted me. So when I first did The Realness, it was like, all right, I'm going to do this album. It's going to be a dedication to my man. It's going to be the album he wanted. Dedication to him, and then I'm out. I'm going back out of town. I didn't think it was gonna blow up. I didn't think, you know, what I'm saying like, it's like you taking a swing. You don't know you're gonna knock somebody out when you take the swing. You're just taking a swing. Right. So when I made the realness, it was that was, that was a dedication to Blue. I was just doing the album. I, had, I got a fifteen thousand dollar check from um, Landspeed. I didn't even cash it. Sat in my book bag. By by the time the summertime came, I showed the owner of Landspeed the check, and he's like, "You still got it?" He's like, "You better cash that." So. <laughs> Um, cause I, I didn't care. I, I, I was doing what I was doing. So when I first went in, independent, it wasn't from, in, it wasn't from ingenuity. It wasn't from, oh, I'm smart. I'm going to go independent cause it's better than the labels. It was, my man just died. Let me, let me do this tribute for him. And also some funny business happened in the industry that also, um, forced me to do the, um, the realness too. Let me keep my stories consistent. When I got off of Def Jam, a label called TBT wanted to sign me. I think they had Little John, right? So they was going to give me, my record deal with Def Jam, violated Def Jam, was 250000 So, And I sat on the shelf for like four years. So, you know, mm -hmm. music depreciates. You know what I'm saying? If, if you have something from four years ago, they're gonna buy you out. It's a buyout. We see that happen in sports. There, there might be an athlete that's not happening. He's sitting, sitting on the bench, and they buy him out. Yep. Yeah. So Jeff Jam was supposed to come with, with a set of with, with a good settlement number. Like, okay, the deal was two fifty. Give us such and such, and take the testament out. Right. So TVT went to Def Jam and said, "Here you go. We got the whole two hundred fifty thousand for you guys." And they said, "No, we want three fifty. Right. I, and my lawyer was fuming because he's never seen nothing. If you could ask your lawyer, you could ask anybody about that. There's no way old music can go up. I'm not, unless it's like a dead famous artist or something like that. That's just, you know what I'm saying? Right. I was on the shelf. The songs are old and y'all charged me a hundred thousand more than the initial deal was. So that was, that was the fuel also. So it was blue and it was them um, trying to F me over because when they said, 350,000. Of course, TBT didn't want to do that. You know what I'm saying? It's like 350,000. Like, wow. So I was saying to myself, damn, they're about to get these guys all their money back. All I wanted was my testament album. So me being mad, the realness was like my FU. It was like a middle finger album to the industry, particularly to that Def Jam regime that mm -hmm. did that. And it was a dedication to Blue. So I went into the studio mad. If you listen to the real, it's a, I come in with a chip on my shoulder. You know what I'm saying? No. Like, oh, get out of my way. We in the streets. You in the street. Like, I really hated the industry. And I was tired of the, the politics and the bullshit. So Blue and Dev Jam are the reasons why I went independent. You put them things, two things together and you get the realness. And when you're mad, sometimes it fuels you even more. I did the realness. And I just told you, it took me two years to do this album. Mm -hmm. It took me two weeks to do the realness. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if somebody had me mad right now, I could probably make a fast album again. Right. So that's where we at with it. All right. Talk about uh Chris Lighty and your relationship with Chris Lighty. Um, you said some real positive things about him in the interview I was listening to. Yeah, Chris Lighty was a giant mm -hmm. in his field. I think people that want to be uh presidents of record companies or managers or 
successful executives that integrate into other fields, I think they should study him. Mm. He he had a way of doing things that that garnered a lot of uh, success. If you look at violated management during what the late mid to the late 90s to early 2000s, that might have been the best rap management company in all of hip hop. Yep. They had 50, they had LL, they had Missy, they had Buster Rhymes, Mob Deep, Nori, you name it. And I'm not, and I'm missing a lot of names. So he he did business the right way. Um, there was times I was frustrated when I was younger, when I was on the shelf, and you know, Chris was the president of Violator, but he wasn't the president of Def Jam. So it was a lot of politics. And um he was like he was like the big brother that you want to impress, the big brother that doesn't give you your props. He gives you tough love sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like earn it. Like he'll be like, like who's telling you your shit is hot? Your friends? Like don't let your friends gas you up like you like you doper than you are. Or like, you know what I'm saying? He makes you want to go out and work harder. That was him. And when he fucks with you, he fucks with you. So, you know, rest in peace to Chris. Um, I'm still in touch with his brother Dave. Dave is my man. You know, shout out to Mike Lighty, shout out to Jonathan. You know, Chris was a giant. He was a giant. And LL, Q-Tip, all those guys, they love him to this day for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Indeed. Rest in peace. Yes. I want to talk about what we see right now in hip hop. And I want to take it back to 5 for 40 again, because in 5 for 40, you were telling a story. You were telling a lyrical story. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of that stuff was true. I'm sure some of that stuff, you was in there just doing your thing. But you never got indicted for it. I never seen Cormega get hit up with a Rico because of anything he said lyrically in any of his records. Nowadays, we seeing brothers get hit by the minute on things they say. And I'm not saying it's justified, but when you listen to the lyrics, it kind of correlates to shit that's going on in the streets and they're essentially telling on themselves. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the new age of hip hop in regards to lyrics, in regards to what they're saying and how it's correlating to them ending up behind bars and just putting another stamp on us killing hip hop artists. That's a, that's a good question. I'll say this. Sometimes we hear a saying and it's so simple. It's like, all right, whatever. Knowledge is power, right? Yeah. The more you know, the more powerful you are. So if you know better, you'll do better. If you're on a song implicating yourself in your music, that is kind of the stupidest thing. It's like wearing a fucking see-through trench coat on with guns and guns in it walking through mm. the airport like you know what i'm saying like your one thing they say uh that's law is your word can and will be used against you yep. in the court of law mm-hmm. um so there's a difference between imagination and creativity now the difference between me and those guys is why you never heard me get indictment because you never heard me go into full detail about things that i was doing in my music when i was when i was uh making a realist album you never heard me, even when I did this interview with you just now. I said I was out of town, but I can say where I was out of town. Right. You know what I'm saying? I said my man Blue got killed because my man Blue was dead. Mm-hmm. I can say where he got killed at. Mm-hmm. I never told you, I never gave incriminating details. And I'm really from that life. A lot of rappers, the reason they fall, the thing I feel sorry about these young brothers is they don't have enough testicular fortitude to be themselves. Damn. In other words, some dudes can't even argue with somebody in their crew because that dude is not really a man. It's somebody you attach yourself to. A lot of rappers want protection and they hang around certain individuals because it makes them feel safer. It makes them safer. So when you align yourself with these kind of people, you're subject to the consequences that they might be subject to. Association by association and similarity and guilty by association. So some of these guys, don't even be about that life. Their mans be about that life. And then to, and then, how do you keep your mans happy? Oh, I'm going to shout them out in the song. Or I'm going to talk about this in the song. So while you're doing that, these guys, they're feeling it. You know what I'm saying? They're not thinking that it's going to get them in trouble one day, but they're feeling it because now it's cool. you down. you down with the crew. But meanwhile, those guys are living a whole different life. They might be hot with the feds. The feds are one of the most patient people in the world, too. That goes back to what I said earlier. Patience is a great acquisition. Feds are patient. They'll let you They'll let you rock out for 10 years. They just want that one right then to get you for, and then they're going to sit you down. So you take a lot of, lot of these rappers, 
And I know this for a fact, because I know a lot of rappers. Mm-hmm. A lot of rappers talk about a life that they ain't about. I've seen a rapper that's tough, scared to go on Rikers Island. You know what I'm saying? And I'm talking about not, not as an inmate. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, and, and, I was, and I always looked at him kind of crazy after that. I was like, wow, I, I still respect him as an artist or whatever, but I don't want to hit a tough, you know, you, like, if you're only as tough as your entourage, who are you when you're alone? Word. So if you're a rapper, if you're really a drug dealer and you really, 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 really make significant money, you might not even want to be a rapper. You might just want to wash your money or you might just want to escape and do something positive. You know what I'm saying? Or oh, I'm retiring and I'm going to open up a record label. You're not going to see a real drug kick pit rapping about drugs or rapping about something that could sit them down. You're not going to see uh, a thinker. You have to have thinkers in your crew. When I see rappers, uh, tour buses getting pulled over and they got guns and drugs, well, guns and stuff, and it's a superstar, it makes no sense. Get a security guard. Word. I seen West Side Gun in Manhattan uh, two weeks ago, right? Mm. It was him. He, had a couple, he, wasn't, he didn't have a lot of people, but he had a, secu- a big security guard with him. I ultimately, immediately had a higher level of respect for him right then and there. Because he he understands he's not a street person anymore. He's from the street, but he's a brand. This guy got an art gallery. He's a musician. He's a brand. Right. So he didn't he doesn't let pride control him. He had a security guard. I respect him for that. Because like if, if an incident happens, security handles that. You don't have to worry, he's not gonna get indicted. He's not gonna, you know what I'm saying? He's not gonna be in jail, manslaughter or some crazy stuff. He got a security guard. A lot of rappers should be doing stuff like that. So when you hang with the guy that's a shooter, a lot of times you gotta understand this. If somebody got a gun on them and the cops come, who's claiming the gun? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you know what? Now you got a gun case and it wasn't even your gun. Wow. If you hanging around drug dealers and the feds is watching, you guilty by association. You might not even be doing nothing. You just hanging out with them, or they break bread with you sometimes. Blah blah. They got if if they if they have surveillance of you with them and they you know you associate with them they're gonna affiliate with you with that you're gonna you know what I'm saying so a lot of these artists that that's uh saying stuff in songs they either they're not on the they're not thinkers they're even not thinkers and they're not really from the street you know what I'm saying and um you just gotta watch what you say you gotta code it and at and and at the same time like. You can't do both. Which one you want to do? Mm-hmm. You want to be a gangster or you want to be a rapper? I'm not a gangster. I'm a rap. I'm an artist. You know what I'm saying? I know I'm from the street. I know who I am as Core Mega. I know who I am. I know what I'm capable of as a person, but I don't want to go to what I'm capable of if it's not necessary. So which one do you want to be? You want to be the gangster? Then why are you rapping? You want to be a rap, you, you want to be a rapper, then why are you acting like a gangster? You gotta figure out what you want to be. So a lot of people, a lot of artists. Are in situations that were totally avoidable. Your man killed somebody, you bragging about it in the song. And you're saying details that maybe only a person that was there or only a person that has significant the information of that crime would know. Mm-hmm. You're saying it in the song. Now, you look at the law, they look at things from logical, they look at things from logical perspectives. If a person got shot from a certain angle or at a certain place or if there's details to a crime that wasn't made public, but you know these details and you say it in the song, you going right. there. Yeah. Wow. That's a fact. Definitely. Could you could you walk us through the whole um Nas and the Glorious situation um as far as the music? How did that go? Was it a phone call? Did you guys get in the studio together? Can you kind of uh take us through that if you can? Glorious was uh a very long overdue thing. You know what I'm saying? Me and Nas is cool. We we back where we needed to be. We back on, we're back. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, we back on the we back where we needed to be. So if, if me and Nas is cool again, what's the what's the main thing a fan's gonna want from Cole Mega and Nas if Mega and Nas is cool? Record. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> did y'all hear it? No. I haven't, yet. No. I haven't heard it, no. We don't hear shit like that no more, man. Love it, man. You know what I'm saying? I've seen a grown man cry after he heard that song. Right. And I was sitting, 
Yeah, and he said that in my listening session. He admitted. I just don't want to say his name in public, but he'll tell you. Um, yeah, I seen him cry when he heard that record. Wow. I seen numerous drunk men say, "Yo, the hairs on my arm is standing," or just gave me goose. Like that song was really strong. And if you listen to my verse, I kind of didn't even have to answer some of the questions y'all asked me. I said it like the last question. I answered it in in this in my verse. Mm-hmm. Yep. I said, "Struggle inspired me to hustle justifiably." Um, no, no, not that part. Uh, uh, I said I, I was faced the decision of going in with rhymes or rubber grips. It's like which one you want to do. I had the decision to make. Am mm-hmm. I gonna rhyme or am I gonna hold these guns? I said I chose wisely, knowing mm-hmm. I walked within the shadow of death with elaborate steps. Like I'm walking in. I lost over 20 of my friends, got killed. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Road to riches is cold and vicious. Some expired before acquired growth and wisdom. It's known when a co-defendant tone is different. We're just talking about this. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Your man is acting a little different. He's talking. You know what I'm saying? Um, what else? Um, not for another, put another real, real, uh, now, now I said, uh, Megan, not who I knew from this music shit. We from the block, a brother I grew up with. Yep. So that's the thing. That's the powerful thing about the realness too. And how we rap. It's like we giving you knowledge in our song. We're not just entertaining you. We 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 saying something. You can bop your head to it. You can rock out to it. You can vibe to it. But I'm saying stuff you can really apply to your life. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying real stuff. My music is like even when you when you spoke about the five for 40 that a slow death is never putting life in motion. Yep. Man. So it's almost like, like you had like a character arc, five for 40 character, and then you arced him and came full circle and right. be a younger self. That's dope. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's like, and I'm just showing y'all love because y'all been trying to get this interview with me for a while. I, I didn't play, I didn't play this music for nobody, especially live. Right. So it's like, y'all, you know what I'm saying? I just want y'all to see. Because every, listen, man, you're going to interview thousands of rappers. Everybody got an album coming out. When the album's coming out, not one rapper in the world is going to say their album is tri- terrible or it's all right or they didn't give it all. They're all going to say it's dope. They're all going to say it's the greatest shit ever. I'm telling you, my album is special. I'm, I don't know how to s- describe it. All I know is the shit is special. Like, you'll see. You know what I'm saying? Like, you'll see. Def- definitely believe it. Um, talk about working with Lloyd Banks, too, man. Another, you know, underrated artist out there how, how was that whole experience hell yeah that was dope um street runner produced that song mm-hmm. um lloyd banks is somebody i really uh admire as an artist um he went and i'll give you a snippet of that yeah man that's it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i'm telling you every storm every yeah, I, I promise you this is not no cap this is not no album promotion i promise you every song is hard Every song. When you looking to drop it? This this come out next Friday. Oh, beautiful! Oh, perfect. I got oh. three album release parties in New York. If y'all if y'all in New York area, if y'all want to pull up, I got three parties. I have one at Sweet Chick on October six. That's gonna be like five o'clock to ten on Vernon Boulevard, Sweet Chick in Queens, not far from Queensbridge. So you want that Queensbridge feel? You go to Sweet Chick. If you oh. want that paid and full feel, you go to uh, H O A. Lounge on Steinway. That's the actual date that I'm coming out October 7th. So we're gonna be on Steinway at the HOA Lounge. That's we trying to make that a movie. And then on the eighth, I got something in Manhattan at this place called Street Lawyer Services. It's a cannabis lounge. So you already know what to expect in there. Sure. And that's gonna be on the eighth. So y'all are invited and y'all are invited to pull up to anything. Right. I'm gonna so ask you it. about uh big pun, man. Mm. Some of your memories with big pun, if you can. I got a lot of memories with Pun. Um, Pun was a real dude. Pun mm-hmm. was a real street dude. You know what I'm saying? He was a real street dude. Um, he had a sense of humor. He always, uh, always wanted to rhyme. Like say, mm-hmm. say Pun is right. Say we walk in the street right now, and Pun is here. He might want to hear something, or he might spit something. But he really took his craft serious. He was a gangster. Always talked. He loved two things. He always talked about with me. One. Guns are always in the conversation and and rhymes. And he's a family man. He'll introduce mm-hmm. to his kids and all of that. Um one of my funniest memories with Pun was um we was doing a show somewhere and he was like, 
yeah, man, I got to go to the fat farm, man. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, I said, hold on for a second. I said, let, me, let me make a call for you. Because at that time, I was on, I was on Violator Slash Death Jam. And Word. who owned Fat Farm? Russell, Russell Simmons. Uh. So I'm like, so we, you know, you know, at that time, he was on Death Jam. You had access to Fat Farm. Or well, I knew people there. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So when he said that, I said, hold on for a second. I'm going to make a call for you. You know what I'm saying? So I was going to call Fat Farm. And be like, yo, my man, Pun wants some shit. You know what I'm saying? He's like, no, not the clothes. I have to go to the fat farm, bro. I'm going to lose weight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I said, oh, shit. So that just shows you the type of person I was. You know what I'm saying? He, he had a sense of humor. He was a good dude. He was a good dude. He was a good dude. He was a spitter. You know what I'm saying? Sure. That's dope. Now, I was, I was watching one of your interviews, and I was thinking about this for a long time, and this is about Funk Flex now. A lot of people like to have jokes on Funk Flex's name. We've given Funk Flex criticism in the past. Mm-hmm. But the last couple of months, I've been watching Flex and I've really gained an appreciation for him and what he's doing and even challenging some of the artists and stuff to come out with new music, promoting them, getting them back into the game. The artists that we grew up loving and, right, and right. talking about. And then yeah. I watched the interview and you confirmed exactly what I was thinking. And yeah. I was like, damn, okay, I might just be on the right track. So talk about pun, or not pun, excuse me, Flex. And is he still important to hip hop and in the game the way he used to be? Because like I said, a lot of people give him criticism, calling him gatekeepers, calling him this, calling him that. And we're not um we're not um innocent in that. We've called we've had given pun, I mean fuck flex criticism before. Mm-hmm. But when I'm watching now, I, I have an appreciation for it. So is flex still important to hip hop in your opinion? Flex is integral to hip hop. It's like say somebody builds a building. Right, and they got a and they and they make themselves a penthouse suite. Right, everybody else is is is, is paying for apartments or whatever, whatever, in that building. And now there's a, and now uh, maybe there's a new building owner. Does it? Do you discredit the guy who uh who built the building that has the penthouse? Because right. it's new, or do you uh? Do you dismiss the the contributions of uh, Rosa Parks? Is she not important anymore? Because everybody gets on the bus now. Right. It's like when I see people say stuff about Flex, it comes from different places, though. It depends on what you're saying, and it and it becomes a point of whether you have the the integrity to admit when you do something like how you just said you you you've done it. Mm-hmm. But you've probably done it for different reasons. I've seen people criticize him for how he talked about Tupac. You know what I'm saying? So that's a whole different reason. But if you're going, but you if you're going to criticize Pony After Flex for hip hop, you're sounding crazy because at the end of the day, he has a job on the radio station. He doesn't own the radio station. He doesn't control everything that goes through the airwaves. So we can't say he's the reason why hip hop is like that when there there's set playlists. For, for DJ to play songs. We all know that. That's for one. For two, Flex put on for the culture. Like his Fun Master Flex Volume 2 album is one of the best compilation albums in hip-hop, in hip-hop history. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's for one. For two, look how many artists that he broke that we all look up to. Like artists that got hotter from going to his show. Cannabis, Nori, DMX, Pun. One of the one of the most rare Cool Mega Nas freestyles that people be playing it on YouTube. That was during that was on the Funk Master Flex show. Mm-hmm. He had Biggie on the show. He had one of the best Biggie freestyles. Yeah. So it's like he did so much for the culture that you can't blame him for the state of it. And um I think the challenge thing, I think that was brought on by uh him and Conway was going back and forth yeah. and Conway said some things and then Flex said some things and and uh I'll say this, like, I think a brother like Conway should just really, just, um, Conway's blessed. Yeah. I think he should just focus on his blessing because he's blessed. Conway makes a lot of money. He's a, His name is getting out there. He's a dope rapper. So don't focus on the people that you think ain't supporting on you, ain't supporting you. Focus on the people that are supporting you. You know what I'm saying? So when you look at a brother like Flex, what did he do? He took that. They say you turn a negative to a positive. He did that, and then he challenged Conway to come up with it, with something. Conway did it. The buzz was 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 there. Everybody was watching. 
So now they're, they're, now they're in a good space. Then he challenged another rapper. Then he challenged another rapper. So Flex, kind of, it's like he opened a new door and he also sounds the critics. He killed two birds with one stone. Cause it's like, now these artists that y'all say y'all love so much, I'm giving them a shot. I'm giving them that, that leeway. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like, what, what y'all got? What are y'all coming with? So you can't front on Flex cause he did too much. Whether, whether it's mixtapes on, on High 97, whether it's the Funk Master Flex albums that came out on Loud Records, or whether it's, I mean, you cannot talk about the tunnel and not talk about Flex. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So he did too much for the culture for people to say he's a gatekeeper. He's not a gatekeeper. He's a, he's just a, he's a, he's an employee of a radio station. And he's, and he's been employed for a very long time because his impact, if he didn't have that impact, he would have got fired or he'd have got demoted. There's no loyalty in, in the industry like that. They're not going to keep you just because they think you're cool. If he wasn't, if he wasn't uh, integral to what what that radio station is doing, they'd have removed him. So you got to give him his, got to give him his props. Some of the stuff that we hear on the radio, we don't like, but we don't have nothing to do with it. And then if we're gonna call, we can't be selective with our criticism. We could crit a lot. We could criticize damn near everybody that's uh, that's iconic, has done something that uh, that we wish they didn't do. But some of us tend to overlook that. So it's like what we have to do is take take the good that that we get from people, and when they're not giving anything good, then you then you know then you can say more. But flex right, right now, flex got dudes from the nineties. He's giving them a look now. When he when he issues a challenge, it's it's a bigger look than some of these artists just putting out music on their own. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to flex, man. He, yeah, he's he's integral, and he put on a lot of people too. Appreciate that. Indeed, man. Well, we're not gonna hold too much of your time. As we see, uh, I think your publicist is down there typing us some stuff, man. But we appreciate you, Core Mega, on the Hip Hop Uncensored podcast this afternoon. Like I said, the last interview here at the current location of Self Made Studios wow. about to move into bigger and better things, brother. So we appreciate you. Got the album coming out October seventh, The Realness Two. Yes, Let the people know where they can find it, where they can find you. Social media handles. The floor is yours, brother. Thank you. My Instagram is Core Mega. That's where I'm mostly at. My Twitter is I am Core Mega. I'm mostly on Instagram though. Um, the album is gonna be on all platforms. We're also gonna have vinyl and stuff soon. Just go to Instagram to find out any information on me. Um, the realness part two, October 7th. The wait is over. Thank you guys for having me. Good luck with your new spot. You know what I'm saying? And I hope to pull up to your new spot. And I and um it was a pleasure letting y'all hear some of the songs you ever see. I I I'll speak to y'all after the seven to see what y'all think about the album. It's an honor, brother. Please do. We would love to have you in there, man. Cormega on a hip hop and sense yeah. podcast. Salute. Honor, brother. Appreciate you. Salute. One love. All right, brother. Thank you. All right. <clears throat>